Happy Friday, June 14th here in the U.S. and Canada. In the U.S., it's Flag Day. Welcome to the season finale of Developer Direct. And I'm here in the studio in Scotts Valley with Anders Olsen. Hello. Anders spent uh, part of this week at the Apple WWDC. Yeah, the keynote was public. And then if you have an Apple, if you have your Apple developer license for either Mac and or iOS, they've been starting to put up the replays. And I guess the the big news, I don't know, there was, I guess, all sorts of news besides iRadio or something in the keynote. I think the biggest one that I've seen questions immediately, I was in Denver, and I think on the web, Serena's webinar on Wednesday and in Seattle for me yesterday, was people were asking, when are we going to have the iOS 7 look? And I think the general answer for that is, well, iOS 7 is not going to be available till this fall. I think Anders was public. That's correct, and we we can't ship anything until it's out of beta anyway. But we have access to the beta, so uh, not to worry. And I think the other thing for me is a lot of it is style, right? I mean, there's some new things like AirDrop and whatever that they talked about, but but that new that new flat style. Uh, we have a whole style system, bitmap styles in in FireMonkey and iOS, uh, as well as Windows and Macintosh. So creating a bitmap style that has that same kind of look is not going to be hard. And we have graphic designers who've created not only the default styles for each platform that you get in XE4, but we have custom styles as well. We'll talk about those in a moment. So having an iOS custom style that actually ultimately will become the default style when you build your application, unless you change the, then have a custom style, and Anders can show that, or I can show how when you build and you choose the SDK that you're targeting, you will get the default style because some things change between 5.1, 6.0, and of course now with 7.0. So never fear and don't worry. Please don't worry. We are on top of it. We had plenty of people in San Francisco this week, and we're on the betas, and we're having fun. Uh, you can join the conversation and take part in many different ways. You can follow us on Twitter at EMBTDdirect. You can use the hashtag EMBTDD so others can find the conversation. And if you have questions during this Friday, you can put them in the Q&A section of the GoToWebinar. And then also we're just going to recap everything that took place during this season. Uh, you can also send emails after the fact to developerdirect.online at embarcadero.com. And that will uh, get to a whole bunch of us, the worldwide developer direct team and members of uh, sales and marketing here in addition. So any kind of questions, everybody carves out if it's a technical question versus a order question or product question, uh, people chime in with the right stuff. This was the schedule. We have all the replays are up on YouTube. You can just go to our Embarcadero TechNet site on YouTube and you can go to choose select playlists and you'll see a developer direct playlist us canada replays all of them uh one through eight this is episode nine so i'll get this one up okay other news next week if you haven't signed up yet is code rage mobile on tuesday and wednesday it's uh two days from 6 a.m to i think about 1 30 or 2 o'clock each day uh technical session some of them are are 45 minutes long, some are 30 minutes long, uh, just depending on the topic. You can see the whole schedule up on uh, the Code Rage landing page, www.embarcadero.com slash Code Rage, or HTTP, The Code Rage, or just The Code Rage, all one word. Uh, lowercase will get you there. You can see all the sessions and times and presenters. Um, lots of cool sessions that will help you. And uh, you know, you'll, if you don't go back to developer direct, you can look in on some of the iOS talks next week and pick the ones that you really need to uh, deal with. Or you go back to the replays from developer direct. Uh, we're doing a lot of new things as well for next week that uh, that are, are presented again. Uh, some of them are going to be, in a sense, repeats of some of the things you might have seen during parts of the shorter demos, but, but having a little more time and I'll, live Q&A with the presenters during each of the sessions in addition. So you can register just like you did for Developer Direct and join the fun. Uh, this was a, this a picture that Stephen Ball put up. Um, Stephen on Wednesday and Thursday did a session called Developer Direct Live. And what he did was he invited these happy smiling, for the most part, developers to come and spend a whole day doing hands-on 
uh, building iOS applications. It, Stephen took some of the materials I did uh, in a two-day workshop in Denmark back in eight, at the end of April, and he put it into a one-day uh, developer direct live, and the head people come to our Maidenhead office. That's the conference room down on the ground floor. And he had this little storyboard kind of document where people could write out an application they were interested in, kind of scratch in and type right in and, you know, uh, I guess you cartoon in things that you wanted to do. Of course, you could use use case modeling in the IDE and create the actor and the different actions for each of the use cases of your application and do it that way in the IDE or use some other graphic drawing tool. He did it in a Word document as sort of a storyboard template. Uh, to help you think in terms of the different screens or tabs uh, that you want in your iOS application. And he had lectures and labs for them to do as uh, as they went through the day. And it was so much demand for it because, well, the room also holds about 20 or so. Uh, he ran two days. And so we're thinking about doing some of that during summer school, winter school, again, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, Either either all day online virtual event and or a multi day uh, through the summer. So stay tuned for news about all those kinds of things that we're going to do during the northern hemisphere summer months, because uh, we know that developers usually don't don't go on vacation. They usually are just uh, programming all the time, right? Or and we'll record them so you can have all that stuff. In any case, we have special offers through the end of June. And you can go to Rad Offer on the Embarcado.com site to get the details. If you already own XE4, just go to the registered user download page, and you can get all those extras, the TMS Cloud Pack components for iOS to access Facebook and Google Drive and Dropbox and all those things from your iOS applications. It logs has components for logging you in and doing things. Uh, the Meta VCL converter, it's the latest version of the VCL converter, which which now also will take your VCL applications and generate a, a starting iOS application if you choose to that. So you can uh, convert your VCL app to FireMonkey. It'll take your your code and create live bindings for it, all of that. So that's the Embarked Air edition of the Meta VCL to FireMonkey converter. There's a premium style pack, which adds two new styles, custom styles for Windows, Mac, and iOS, the Jet style, the Diamond style. We already had the black style in the transparent style in addition to the default styles for Windows, Mac, and iOS. And also Mac and Cloud, uh, if, you're, if you own uh, XE4, you can go to the Mac and Cloud and there's instructions how to do that. And Mac and Cloud is uh, as a Macintosh in the, on the internet that is preloaded with the PA server and Xcode. So if you don't have access to a Mac, uh, you can point your ID at the IP address of a Mac and Cloud instance, you can use 24 hours of usage over a 30-day period to run your app, develop and run your apps in the simulator. And so, again, all those are listed in the red offer. But if you own XE4 already, you get uh, all of that. And again, Lewis, if you own XE4, you go to your registered user download area, so edn.embarkado.com, and then under the Downloads menu, there's a Registered User Download. You log in, and you'll see not only... Uh, updates and other things, but you'll see all of these pieces listed in uh, in the Red User Download. Okay. Uh, other thing is, of course, uh, also in Registered User Downloads, you can get the XE4 Update 1 that just came out on Monday uh, with a bunch of bug fixes and such are in there. There's notes in the doc wiki about what's in the, the XE4 Update. And, uh, and also there's a help update that came out, I think, last week or the week before. Of course, the doc wiki always has the latest of everything. And then the help team every month or so takes the doc wiki and creates the help files for Windows that you can integrate into the ID. So, so two downloads, help update one and, and, and the product update one are both available now. Just to know, fat, uh, fast report VCL and FMX. Those are in the register, the marketer editions are in the register user download area. And if you want the full featured products from Fast Report, uh, you can go and get those from them if you already own them or if you want to purchase them, uh, which have even more features than the Embarcadero edition. And they have feature comparison matrices of what's in the standard edition, the Embarcadero edition, the professional enterprise editions, and so on. 
So you can go and look at those at, at the FAST report site to see what you're missing if you're only using the Embarcadero edition. So all of that is in registered user downloads as well. Okay, Lewis, uh, it's okay that your daughter was talking kids come first, family first, but maybe she wants to uh, be on the computer as well. No problem. Uh, latest cool code snippets. We always want to remind everybody that all the mobile samples and the iOS code snippets, in fact, all of the XE4 demos, even the VCL demos, we keep all of those and the previous versions of Brad Studio XE3, XE2, XE, all the demos are in SourceForge. So there's the path to the XE4 uh, demos. Uh, those are also installed when you install the product in your uh, public uh, users, public, public documents, Rad Studio. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Give me a hand sign next to stuff. Yeah, sorry. Um, the, uh, in the user, public, public documents, Rad Studio 11.0, or whatever the version is, you'll see samples folder. And if you have a, a subversion plugin, like I use Tortoise SVN, you can right mouse click on samples and say update. And it will uh, it'll update your local samples from the SourceForge repository. So it's a great way to always keep up to date on latest code snippets, latest samples, whether it's for mobile or the regular samples, uh, updates to those. Uh, you can also just go and put your browser at SourceForge and take a look at what's going on and browse around them as well. But always the demos are updated and put in SourceForge first and then are pulled down as part of the install build process. I should mention that for help update, uh, for EXE4 Update 1, there's also an ISO version where we merged in the update uh, into the bigger install. So you can, uh, if you want to have the ISO and you're a paid customer, you can go to the Red User Download area and you can find the ISO uh, to create a, a disk version of a full install. Or you can just grab, I think it's 300 and some, 330 megabyte uh, patch file. It's a patch file. It takes a while. I was installing it while I was sitting in the airport waiting for six hours for the plane to be fixed, uh, I installed the update. And I think it took about, depends on your machine, it took me about 35 minutes or so to run all the patch updates. All right. And again, here's the uh, link to our events page on embarkadero.com if you want to see what other upcoming events. There's still, I think, Anders, you're in Salt Lake and Boston next week? Yes. And Al Manorino is going to be in Washington, D.C. next week. Al was, uh, I forget where he was this week. I was in Denver and Seattle this week. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, check out if you're in the Washington, D.C., Boston, or Salt Lake City area. Uh, Anders and Al are on the road next week uh, during uh, Code Rage Mobile, but Anders is recording his sessions, and we're going to hook him in during parts of the time live from wherever he is, either at the airport or a hotel or something. So uh, look for those events if you want to be face-to-face -face, uh, next week as well. All right, so just a few comments, and then we'll get to some demos about uh, recapping what we did during this year, uh, this episode season. Uh, we spent a lot of time on iOS and FireMonkey, especially because of the release of XE4. Uh, we also covered uh, different demos using different languages on all the different platforms, so Delphi and C++, Windows, Mac, and iOS. And this is the architecture slide reminder that how we get, get everything done ultimately is FireMonkey. It is an abstraction layer and an implementation of components and, and runtime library that uses the graphic subsystems and platform subsystems on the different uh, Windows, Mac, and iOS for Delphi and Windows and Mac for C++. Uh, for 3D, we, you, we use DirectX 9 and, and or DirectX 10, depending on what you have. Obviously, the Windows 7 and 8 platform. Uh, for OS 10, uh, a lion and mountain lion. Uh, we use OpenGL on on Macintosh and OpenGL OpenGL ES on iOS. And then once we get to Android, we'll again have full support for the core graphics library for 2D and for 3D uh, using OpenGL ES and the oh I forget what it's called now. Maybe it's Quartz on Android uh, versus Core Graphics on iOS. But what you care about is that you want to use 2D shapes, you want to use 3D shapes, you want to play media files like audio and video, uh, you want to be able to display your user interface, and you can do all of that with FireMonkey. So look at the FireMonkey source code, and you can see the, the platform 
uh, agnostic bits, FM, fmx.media.pass, for example, and then you'll see fmx.media.win.pass as the Windows-specific things that we need to implement on that platform, fmx.media.mac.pass uh, and fmx.media.ios.pass. So you have all of those. If you have the professional through architect edition, you have all the source code to see how we implement all the FireMonkey bits and the system and the framework agnostic bits. Those are all in the system name scope, system dot media, system dot sensors, system dot devices, and so on. Uh, you'll see all of that in the source code, so you can see how we did it, how we call into the API, how we get to the operating system. And Anders has been doing some blogs, and others have been blogging about how how they have been wrapping. Uh, different APIs, Anders mentioned in, and showed in some of the previous demos, uh, uh, push notification servers. Uh, now he's got IAD. I'm not sure about in-app payments. Did they accept that, Anders, in the store yet? Uh, not yet, but they should pretty soon. They were probably busy at WWDC. Who knows what they were doing, too. But Anders is going to show you some of that again and recap some of that here in the in the recap of the whole season retrospective. Again, it's all about... Uh, one code base, you create your project, a mobile project, a Windows project, Macintosh project, share the code, same button, same con combo box, same calendar edit, all those things, same database access uh, on client side and database server side on Windows with DataSnap, uh, IB Lite running on iOS, the interface, whole interface server running on Macintosh, Windows, Linux, Solaris. So all the things you can do makes it easier for you if you've got one team uh, to build all the applications you need across all the different platforms we currently support. And again, stay tuned for Android. It's being worked on. If you own XE4, we will invite you to the field test, just as we invited XE3 customers to the iOS field test. So, you know, get on XE4, learn FireMonkey 3, learn how we do the one code base multi-platform support and you'll see how magic it'll be as we move to additional platforms uh, in the future. And the great thing on Delphi and C++ Builder is that it's all about native code force. For Delphi, we have we give you five compilers. I always joke and say that's a lot of compilers when people ask what's the value of the payment of the professional edition, for example, or the enterprise or whatever. I tell you, I say, look, you get five native code optimizing compilers. Just do the division of the math, that's that's a, a, a great value all along. We don't convert the Delphi code to Objective-C and compile it for OS for OS 10 or iOS. We simply use our Delphi compilers to create ARM code, Intel code, Intel 32-bit, 64-bit code. Same thing as C++ for Windows and Mac. We have a, a C++ compiler for 32-bit Windows and Mac and a 64-bit compiler for Windows, and we're going to take this same ARM code emitting and tool chain for C++, and that'll get C++ to iOS and Android this year as well. Uh, we also introduced, uh, in the early part of this season, uh, FireDAC. Uh, FireDAC, uh, uh, which we acquired from the DA Soft company, was called AnyDAC at that time. It's a multi-platform. You can use it with VCL and FireMonkey. It's non-visual controls. They're framework agnostic. You can build the same apps that run on Windows, Macintosh, and iOS using FireDAC. FireDAC is our future direction. DB Express is still around. You can use it. So all your code that uses DB Express is there. Uh, FireDAC gives you just more performance, more capabilities, more access to more databases, including Postgres. People always ask about that. So FireDAC is the future. And if you have the Enterprise Edition and above, you just go to the Registered User Download page, and you can uh, download FireDAC for XE4. And there's an update. Make sure you use the Update 1 version of FireDAC for XE4. XE4 is, is enterprise ready. It's iOS is enterprise ready. You can build a, a mobile app and talk through SOAP and REST. You can talk to DataSnap servers. Everything that you can build on a client on Windows, client on Mac, as long as it's not platform specific, like calling into AD on Windows or something like that, uh, or calling a Windows API directly, you'd have to if diff around some of those things. Everything you can build client side, you can take your app and on iOS and build the client side as well. 
But we also have Interbase Lite, as I mentioned, which is Interbase in a, in a static library that you can link into your uh, iOS applications. You can also use SQLite. That's embedded in the operating system. It gives you four data types and a locking mechanism. Uh, Interbase gives you all the ANSI 92 SQL data types as well as the Interbase data types, as well as you can have one transaction live at a time with IV Lite. And then if you need to have more transactions and more power, if you want to need encryption of database table and columns, then you can use Interbase to go and you get licenses for that. We give you a test deploy license for Interbase to go as part of XE4. We also give you a, a deployment license for IB Lite so you can embed it in. It gets linked into your application. You can take the same Interbase databases that run on Windows, Mac, Linux, and Solaris and embed it into your application bundle that's on iOS. And then you've got a fully running uh, database application with all the capabilities of Interface sitting in an iOS application. So all this, if you've got enter enterprise infrastructure, SOAP servers, REST servers, it's all there. This is just a summary of, of what you get with the different editions of IB, of Interbase. Server edition, Interbase to go edition, and IB Lite. So again, IB Lite one core. So you get a key when you buy the product for IB Lite, use that to register to get the reg file, which is the text file with all this gobbledygook uh, stuff. I like that term, gobbledygook. A bunch of characters that make the, uh, the license file. You just embed that license file in your application as well. And you've got a full interface running in your application. So again, it, it has some limitations, but you can deploy it to the store, you can put, uh, you can have a million users using the application at the same time. Uh, it's limited to 100 megabytes for database size, otherwise then move up to Interbase to go. And again, one transaction, one CPU. So you can see the differences between the additions. But it's free deploy. Uh, just embed it as part of your application when you link it to the static library. Lots of different new features in XE4. Uh, the ones that don't say uh, FireMonkey, you can use all of those things in your VCL applications as well. So sensor support, device support, uh, platform information uh, through the platform services, all anything in that system dot namespace, system dot sensors, and so on, you can use in VCL and FireMonkey. Visual live bindings, live bindings, use those in your VCL apps and your FireMonkey apps. All of that's a FireDAC, you can use that in your VCL apps. Uh, and your FireMonkey app. So all of that stuff is there. All right. Well, let's see if Andrews is ready, or is it time for me on demos? Um, I can go. Okay, great. Uh, what I'll do is uh, Andrews will take control and do a few different demos. He's got an iPhone and an iPad over here, and then he's got his IDE, of course, and, uh, and the PA server. So, Andrews, you just uh, find which one of you. There's two Andrews logged in. And he's taking control. And I see your iPad running on uh, probably his uh, reflector, I guess, huh? Yep. Okay. It's running our reflector. Uh, we're going to close this guy for now and come back to it later. Uh, let's start out with just a little recap of the uh, start screen. If you haven't taken the uh, start screen for a, uh, for a spin yet in the trial or in the shipping product, uh, take a look at it. Uh, I just wanted to recap this uh, share sheet application, pretty simple application to actually uh, get started with uh, for taking photos and sharing on uh, different things. So here uh, we have a button which is hooked up to an action and the action list is over here, and we see that we have a take photo from camera action, and the on did finish taking event hooks into take photo from camera action, um, did on did finish taking. And what we do here is simply assign the bitmap that comes from the camera and assign that to the background on our uh, UI, uh, so this image will be replaced. Similarly, we have this share button, which is hooked up to the show share sheet action, which is here. And 
we need to do something there on before execute. Before it gets shared, we need to make sure that the bitmap on the screen is the one that gets assigned to the share sheet bitmap. And then, of course, the share sheet will pop up and we will uh, share it on Twitter or Facebook or send it via email, uh, copy it to the camera roll, etc. So let's do a few things here to this application uh, that wasn't done uh, originally. For instance, very simply, we can set the uh, style look up here because why not have uh, the camera button, uh, which is somewhere here. And then this guy can be the share sheet or sharing button, which is also up here, this one. And put it on here, somewhere like that. So now let's go ahead and run this um, on my device. I'm going to just uh, cheat and run it directly from here. So I have it running here. Here's the application. <clears throat> Take my cover off so I can use the camera. I'm going to hit the camera button. It goes into uh, the camera. There's the uh, power supply and everything. And here's David. And we have an infinity picture here. Look at that. Take the picture. So we're still in the camera app. Now we can scale it and and uh, use it. So let's uh, let's go over here. Say so use. Now it's on the uh, background of the application. So now we'll go ahead and hit share. And let's go to Twitter. So here we're going to put this in here. Oops. And let's see. Live at the season finale of developer direct. And why not put in this uh, hashtag as well, which is uh, EMBTDD. Hit send. And just to double check, we can go to uh, my Twitter page here and hit reload. And there it is. There's the picture. All right, so that's a very, very simple, uh, very, very simple demo. It's got two lines of code in it, one for taking the picture and one for sharing it. That's how easy it is to use the share sheet demo and use the share sheet and the camera uh, in your application. All right, let's go to something different, uh, a little recap on uh, push notifications. So uh, here's my iPad. I'm going to lock the screen. So now it's all black, right? So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go to uh, my EC2 instance. So here's my uh, Amazon EC2 server. I have put in a message here that says uh, Delphi Direct push notification from Amazon EC2 APNS uh, server written in Delphi XE4 to a Delphi XE4 client, just to make it a really long message. Okay, so I'm just going to fire off and see what happens here. So what we can do is uh, make sure we're disconnected first just for fun. Uh, I'm going to hit, hit my iPad. So really quickly, I'm going to connect. And then I'm going to send the message. I'm going to slide over to the uh, reflector and see if I can beat it. And there's my message. So Delphi Direct push notification from Amazon EC2 APNS server written in Delphi XC4 to a Delphi XC4 client. So how is that done? So of course we can open here and we go into the uh, application. That's the demo application uh, that gets the push notification. It was created by uh, one of our MVPs. Um, he's in Venezuela, uh, Luis uh, Felipe uh, Gonzalez. And let's go take a look and see 
just a little recap of, of what it does here. Open the project, which is uh, on my desktop in this directory. Here's my group. Okay, so here you saw this on the screen already. Luis Felipe Gonzalez Torres um, iOS application. Uh, that's the uh, client. We have the server uh, is over here. So this is just simply using a TCP client and a SSL handler. Um, HC, uh, the, these are indie components, two baseline uh, indie components. Uh, I'll dig into details in my CodeRage mobile uh, webinar on how this actually works. It's using uh, a couple of uh, SSL certificates and uh, keys and things like that are in these uh, PM files. These are coming from the uh, developer uh, portal for Apple and then the TCP client uh, is in there. So when I connect, I simply go ahead and connect, disconnect, I disconnect, and then I have my device tokens for my iPad and my iPhone just hard-coded into this application because it's a uh, development test application. So uh, oh, where did that go again? If I go back here, the design, and you notice I could select iPhone or iPad over here. And then when I send the message, it simply connects automatically, picks whatever um, device token I have, and then sends the message and writes it here on the I.O. handler of the TCP client. And then my super secret passwords for cracking open my certificate is uh, Delphi X64 rocks there. Never do this, by the way, plain text passwords in, the, in source code. That's not a good idea. All right, so if you want more details on this, uh, check out my blog, which links to uh, Luis Felipe's uh, example. He's got the source code up there. Uh, the only thing I did was modify it for my uh, certificates and my device tokens, essentially. That's what I did. I took his demo directly. So more on that in Code Rage Mobile. So let's take a look at iAd and in-app purchasing now. So let's go ahead and, and well, I don't know why my menus do that when I resize the screen. That's bad behavior. Okay, open project. Uh, I have my analog clock in here. Hopefully this is the latest one. Yep, okay, cool. So, of course the clock tab is just um, uh, the clock hands here. Uh, and the purpose is here uh, was to show off uh, iAd. So we have another partner uh, in the community that uh, created a iAd uh, wrapper, uh, Simon Choi. So this is his code directly taken from, from his uh, public uh, blog page uh, that shows how to uh, load the, in this case, iAd framework. You can see that here, right? And then he creates an add banner view class, uh, a delegate, and a TIOS add uh, component. He doesn't install the component on the palette. Uh, that's probably the only thing missing in here. But basically, he responds then to uh, messages like will load add, did fail to receive add with error, uh, did load add, action should begin, and action finished. Pretty simple, uh, pretty simple little wrapper that works uh, very nicely. So the way I am using it is, um, so since I added in that purchasing, if we have not bought the remove ads uh, product, then we'll go ahead and create the IO, iAd component and show it at the bottom of the screen. Um, height and width is what I pass in here, and then the create method, he basically subtracts uh, whatever the height 
of the ad is. And then on receiving a message, we go ahead and hook that into add message. So this is really all you have to do. You have to create this instance of the TIOS add, iAd component, put it somewhere, uh, pass item with in this case. And I'm responding to add message. So what is add message? Let's go take a look. Find the creation. Okay, so here what I do is in the one that's in the App Store right now, if you actually don't get an ad, you get a blank white area at the bottom of the screen. Well, that's not fun. So what I did instead is if I get a failure, I remove the ad control from the super view, uh, which is an Objective-C term or, or iOS term for, um, for the form, really. If we load an ad, then I add in the subview. So I display the ad if it loaded correctly. Okay, so that's the ad part. Now the in-app purchasing part. So this is, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, This wasn't prepared, so in-app purchasing component for Delphi XE, oops, XE4. Uh, it's flash AV, I know that. Uh, I put that in too. There we go. So in that purchase component. So this is the component uh, that I used. Um, I asked him for the component. He sent it to me very nicely. And um, it actually um, had a few things missing. So I've worked with him to, uh, uh, he's, um, I gave him uh, some support there. So he's got now uh, the correct implementation. And uh, the way I found out is, uh, I submitted a, an application or this analog clock with in-app purchasing support enabled. Well, he didn't have the restore functionality. So you actually have to have that restore functionality on what's called non-consumable products. So if you buy something like um, ad removal uh, to go pro level or whatever you want to call it of this analog clock, then if the user uninstalls or installs the app on a new uh, device, with the same Apple ID, you have to provide support for restoring that previous purchase that the user should not have to pay for again. So uh, I assisted him with that. So if we go here to the Setup tab, we can see that I have an in-app purchasing item here in my list box at the top. I have a Buy button and I have a Restore button. So when I buy, if I successfully buy the product, then I kill the ads. And that's simply a matter of, in this case, remove it from the super view, disposing of the component completely. And then I actually remove uh, the list box item and the header. So this entire area will disappear when you successfully buy. If you restore, I call restore purchase, and as a follow-up, if it succeeds, the same method will then be called on successful purchase. So if we just go ahead and, uh, and run this on my device, and now I've set it up with a test account that I'm going to delete uh, immediately after this broadcast because I have to show you the password and the username, otherwise uh, you know, you'll know you think that I'm doing something behind the scenes. It just shows you the keyboard and everything on the screen. So let's go ahead and run the analog clock here. And if we wait a little bit, we should get some ads. So here I am connected to the iAd uh, network. Of course, this ad is in the iAd. Since it's development, it's an ad for iAd itself. And it tells you about the features of iAd, et cetera, et cetera. So we close the ad. 
And then we'll go ahead and go to the setup screen here where I normally can set up uh, what clock face I want. Now I can decide to buy or restore. Let's say I want it to be tricky and see if I can restore it now. I've never bought it with this uh, Apple ID, so I'm going to go ahead and put in my Apple ID, which is uh, this one. And I'll put in uh, the super secret password that nobody can read. Okay, it's not doing anything, so it's basically telling me, uh, I'm not I'm actually not responding to the uh, error message in here, but there was a mer error message firing back and saying, hey, you've never bought this, so uh, you can't restore it. Okay, so let's go ahead and buy it. Fine. You want to buy this for 99 cents in the sandbox environment here? Sure, we'll go ahead and do that. And since I had already authenticated, you notice that it successfully bought it. The entire um, in-app purchasing part of the UI disappeared completely. I go back to the clock, and now I'll never see another ad. And of course, if I delete the app, redeploy it, I, I can go do a restore, and it will do the same thing. So that's essentially how you can use um, this third-party component from uh, Flash AV uh, software. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, to David, I think. And by the way, this has uh, been submitted to the App Store, so it should be approved shortly, and I'll keep you posted on my blog when, when it does or when it doesn't. So that's my Macintosh side with my PA server running down here. I'll switch over to the ID. I've applied update one, so help about uh, XE4, C++, Polite XE4, update one. I haven't done the help update one yet, but I'll, I'll do that next. So that's there, and that also included a PA server package, so I copied it over the Mac and, and, and ran it, and it's sitting there. A couple examples I want to show. First, a C++ image effects example. Uh, this uses the input and output part of the filters that come with iOS. There's also a great FireMonkey sample for iOS for iPad and iPhone for applying effects to pictures that you take, and you can check that out. It's in the, uh, it's in the FireMonkey mobile samples area. Uh, this one is a C++ version. What I've got is two track bars, and I've got a track bar that sets the amount of the percentage of sepia that I'm going to associate with uh, with this uh, with whatever bitmap that I want to load. And also, I, I use the magnify effect. Let's look at the code behind uh, on the on the form create. I cr I create two filters: uh, a sepia filter type and a magnify filter type. And then when I uh, do the open button click, I bring up a dialog box and uh, find some images and so on. And then uh, I load the file of the image in. I apply, I stick the, I set the input of the sepia filter equal to the image bitmap. And then I set the amount equal to whatever the track bar is, the track bar value for the amount of percentage of sepia. Uh, I have, I set the center property of the magnify filter to a point that is at the width and height divided by two, so the center point of the size of the image. I set the radius by default to uh, 35%, and then I set the input filter of the magnify filter equal to the output of the sepia filter, and I set the magnification to the magnify track bar, and then finally set the second bitmap uh, image to the output of the magnify filter. So this is how you can chain the output of one filter to the input of another to the input of another and so on if you want to apply multiple effects. If you use the if you use the components that's a single effect for a single image and of course then you could output the image and, and have another component and take the output of that. But this is how you use input and outputs uh, in the filters, the input filter and the output filter. And then finally, if I change the sepia track bar, uh, I need to make sure and reapply the, the sepia amount and whatever magnification is current set. And, uh, and the same thing for the, uh, for the magnification guy, I just do that all together. And then you can save the bitmap uh, of the resulting image. So let's, uh, let's try this one and uh, let's do the koala bears, for example.
So here I can do the magnification and the sepia, and it seems like, uh, oh, there's the magnification. It was just very small. Uh, so here we can zoom in and change more sepia again uh, back and forth and magnification back. And then we could save the bitmap. So that's a C++ version using input and output filters, uh, the inputs and outputs of filter effects they're using. And these are these filter effects uh, are the lower level classes uh, here where I create them, inform create. These are the lower level filters that the components themselves, so a T sepia effect, which is a component uh, down here in the component palette of all the different effects. Uh, here they are down here. So, for example, shadow effects, bevel effects, all of these tune effects, uh, swirl, and so on, the uh, sepia. So these components are sepia effect that use the lower level filter classes. And again, if you want to chain them together, just create and use the lower level filter classes uh, inside of your application uh, directly. And then here's a... Uh, Let's see, where did I put, oh, here's the, here's an iOS version. So I've got an iPhone form factor here. I've got an image. In this case, I just stuck the koalas in. And then I've got two buttons, I'm uh, sorry, two track bars, a sepia track bar. In this case, I'm using the tune effect, uh, which will give it a sort of cartoony uh, work on the, the color parts of the image. And so on the form create, I create, the filter sepia and the tune filter. Uh, I start the sepia amount at zero, and I start the tune track bar at whatever it was currently set at. I think it, I, the default starting is 35. We'll look at that in a moment. And then I have a tune track bar change, and I have a sepia track bar change to apply the inputs and outputs. Again, the input filter of tune is the output from the sepia filter. And the same thing down here, the input filter of tune is the output of sepia. So regardless of which track bar I, I change. And then if I look at the track bars, uh, sepia takes 0 to 100%. So I have the, the min and max being 0 and 100%. And I have the starting value at 0. For the tune track bar, uh, I have a min and max of, of uh, 3 to 15. That's what the documentation says the min and max for the tune effect are and I have it set to five a little bit more than than the beginning so a little bit of effect taking place just for fun for change and this one I can run on the simulator or the device I left my phone in the other room so I'll I'll just run it on the simulator I don't, I'm not using any hardware specific GPS or whatever so here's the output image down below here's the input image that was there notice it's got a little bit of tune effect happening around it because I've got this set if we don't want uh, if we want a lot or a little bit uh, or some or none we can use this one we can again apply sepia and do some nice fun things with it um, and so it's just an example to show that since the iOS devices have GPUs and our desktop devices have GPUs and the FireMonkey image effects there's like 50 or so effects and transitions that are all implemented as pixel shader. I think monochrome isn't. I think there's a monochrome direct runtime, uh, but otherwise it's the pixel shader effects that uses the GPU. It ships, we ship the image into the GPU to offload the storage, and then all the effects are, and effects manipulation are done in the GPU, and then we just get the bitmap back out of the GPU. So the GPU can do some of the work and leave our, uh, our CPU to do uh, all the other all the other processing that it needs to do for your application itself. I think two other quick demos, and then we'll we'll look at questions and so on that are in uh, in GoToWebinar. These are just some that were shown in the past, and I was on the road last week in Orange County in Santa Monica, or Laguna Hills in Santa Monica, this week in Denver, and in Seattle yesterday. For all of you that are the hardcore Delphi types, and remember back enough, I also had dinner with Charlie Calvert, Charlie and Margie Calvert, uh, on Tuesday night in Seattle. And Charlie's doing great. Uh, he's, a, he's retired uh, from working for companies, but he's actually teaching at a, a local college in Bellevue, Redmond. He's teaching at Bellevue College. So if you search for Charlie Calvert or Charles Calvert, Bellevue College, 
you'll see him on the faculty in computer science and IT uh, as an adjunct professor. He teaches an object class using C Sharp. Sorry, Charlie, I'm going to come after you again. Uh, and then he teaches a mobile Android class, and he teaches a cloud uh, application development and use class uh, up there in different quarters. So uh, Charlie's doing great. He looks great. And uh, he's having fun helping these young students get uh, up to speed on programming. This is Marco Cantu's Delphi Feeds. And I, I like showing this one because it's a reminder to, again, on the client side, that you can do all sorts of things, including we have all the Project Indie components for iOS. So we have Project Indie components now compiled for Windows, Mac, and iOS. So this is the TID HTTP component to do HTTP requests. And Marco's demo uh, uses that to get an RSS feed from either DelphiFeeds.com or from the Embarcadero blog server. He then takes the string that comes back as the RSS feed and he puts it into the XML document and the XML document then parses the XML, and then he can go through all the child uh, nodes of the RSS feed document, XML document and pull out the things that he's interested in. The main property of the XML document is the DOM vendor. So in that case, it's Atom XML v4. That's a cross-platform DOM. Uh, XML document on Windows, of course, had as its default MS XML originally. And of course, that's platform specific. That's Microsoft's XML parser as part of the operating system. So for cross-platform, use the Atom XML v4 or, or maybe another DOM that you've downloaded somewhere and, and want to use. And then the code behind, uh, what he does is he's got, uh, depending on which tab you choose, so if you're on the Feeds tab or the Embarcado tab, then he goes to a different URL and he sets the, the list box appropriately based on the uh, on the tab you're on. And he either calls us the blogs.embarcado.com slash feeds.wpmu because we use Word, WordPress uh, MU feed or the Delphi feeds uh, itself. Down here he calls HTTP get, calls the get method of the HTTP indie component, passing it the URL string that he wants to get the RSS feed from. And then he loads that string into the XML document, activates the parsing of the XML document, and then he's got a loop here where he, uh, for each of the tab pages that have list box on them, he goes and gets the child nodes, for example, looking for items, title, author, publishing date, and so on. And then he populates the right list box and says he's done. So let's just run this example on the simulator. And here he's got... Uh, the Delphi Feeds tab is selected versus the Embarcado tab. You click the, the button, and it goes out to Delphi Feeds, gets it. So here's some of the latest. If you are an EDN mobile user, da -da 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 -da, it looks like a David Clegg post. Uh, Delphi Geek register for OmniThread Library, which is an excellent uh, threading library by, I can't pronounce, Gabrielle Chef. How do you pronounce his last name, Anders? Primosh Gabrielle Gabriel I think. Something like that, Gabrielle Chuck. Uh, he's got a great OmniThread library, which implements the software transactional memory, uh, and he's got all sorts of great examples for high-performance threading, working with Delphi. And looks like a, uh, an SDN, the Software Developer Network event, Bob's got a post. Uh, TOB isn't the only index. Yeah, I've had it with those guys. I've been in and out with those guys. Oh, sorry. XE4 Update 1, news about that. FireDAC being used, uh, and so on. And then, oh, fixed Tyobi index. I don't have to find that one. He doesn't have a click on it to navigate around, but that's the next step. And then we switch to the Embarcadero tab, and he gives you the feed thing down at the bottom. So here, uh, update four, Matthias is our software consultant in Germany, so he's done a, a, a German blog post. And again, here's blog posts that are coming from the Embarcadero, and you can see down here the, the tabs. And if we... Uh, Let's see if we switch this to iPad. What does it do? The iPad look, and then, oh, let's see where it's somewhere over here. Oh, Delphi, Delphi feet. Is that it? Maybe that's it. Oh, he said it for iPhone, so it's not going to really uh, do anything different, I don't think, here. If we rotate it left, for example, yeah. Well, it gives you a little bit more of the information that way, but... You could also use a form family, or you could write code in your in your 
application startup to test if you're on an iPad or an iPhone, load a different form if you wanted to give more details. I guess the next step here would be to click on one and have it slide animate to another page, which would have the detail or maybe even take you with the T web browser component to the article itself. So lots more to happen, I'm sure, in, uh, in Marco's Delphi feeds example for iOS. Well, I guess it's this one again, and, and I want to do this as a reminder that Enders has a blog post. So this just takes a URL and then displays uh, in the T-Web browser component whatever the URL you told it to go to. And, and the point here, and maybe that's fixed in update one. I don't know, Anders, you probably know. But what I needed to do before update one is I had to go into the source code. Anders had the, the sample code and go to the, uh, the constructor and set another field, which is here. Yeah, that for some reason didn't make it, I think. Okay, so so Anders blogged about it. So you open up the source code fmx.webbrowser.ios.pass, which is which I've added to my project. Set fwebview.set scales page to fit to true. So this little comment, add this line, and save that back of the source code. And you might want to copy the the original source first into a backup copy and then just add this line of code and Anders has that on his blog and that way if there isn't a mobile version of the page when your iPhone goes to the site uh, it will load the whole page into the space available in the client area and then from there you can use gestures to to zoom in and out pinch and and, and zoom uh, in and out so let's just run this on the, the simulator so here's that app let's put in a market arrow.com and go and then what will happen is notice now I get the whole Embarcado page we don't have a mobile uh, optimized version that would give you a subset so before that one line change in the fmx web browser dot iOS dot pass you get sort of the upper left hand corner of the uh, of the web page showing up in the air client area of your uh, T web browser component on iOS so adding that one line uh, if it doesn't fit naturally uh, it will zoom it out so that it all fits inside and then you can still you know click on things and so on to do to do your work and there we go to the page and then again that page uh, gets fully loaded and we can go backwards and forwards and so on that's just an example and again Anders blog is blogs.embarcadero.com slash AO he's got all sorts of little tidbits and points you to the I add uh, information that was done by the Korean developer who's been wrapping some of the other components, including, was he the one that also did the in-app purchases? No, that was that a slash AV. Okay, that was that was another one. Okay, so lots of stuff that people are doing. I remember in the early days of uh, Project Jedi, what Project Jedi started as is it started as uh, a bunch of community members wrapping Windows APIs that the team here for Delphi and C++ Builder hadn't gotten to yet, and then they extended out to build source code controls, system additional components and all sorts of things so so there's lots of people out there who are helping us in the community uh, working with uh, and wrapping uh, iOS APIs Anders has a talk at Code Rage Mobile next week about wrapping APIs and how to use it of course you can always look in the FireMonkey source code for the pattern uh, here let's do it this way let's go to my uh, browser sorry my Explorer users public Public documents, Red Studio, Leveno. No, I'm going to the wrong spot, David. Program files, Embarcadero, Red Studio, Eleveno, Source, FMX. So in here, you can look for patterns like FMX uh, GPU Canvas, 2D, 3D Canvas. Then there's some specialty code. If you see the patterns iOS and Mac in front of the .pass extension. Let's go down to media, I think, is a good one for the multimedia handling. So the abstraction class is fmx.media.pass, and then there's fmx.media.win.pass, fmx.media.mac.pass, and fmxmedia.ios.pass. So you can look at these iOS and Mac and win.pass files to see how we're hooking into the operating system, the lower level APIs, and so on for different... Uh, system so pickers the custom pickers the date picker and so on phone dialer here's an iOS version uh, platform interface the abstraction fmx dot platform iOS Mac uh, win printer 
uh, printer, fmx.printer, iOS, printer, Mac, printer, win. Uh, I'm not sure what the three letters are. I suspect maybe it'll be A and D for Android once it starts showing up in, uh, in the world. But you can take a look at, uh, at all of those implementation source code if you want to see again how we wrap. And also go to Anders' blog, uh, blogs.inmarketo.com slash AO, because Anders has uh, all sorts of little examples that he's been blogging about and pointing to other people that are also wrapping parts of the API that we haven't wrapped either with components or runtime library interfaces yet. We always have information on the developer network site and on embarcadero.com. Just want to make sure to remind you that you can always find it there. Also, uh, the reviewer's guide and Marco Cantu's excellent Delphi language for mobile development white paper that talks about um, automatic reference counting. Uh, when you create objects, just forget about them. You can call free and decrements the count and then the goes to zero, they'll be they'll be disposed. You can always call dispose of if you know that you want to get rid of that object in memory and that you control it and you know what's going on, there's a dispose of call. All your code works, you know, creating and freeing it all is, is good. Uh, with is deprecated, but you can still use it if you want to. That's your choice. Big battle time, I'm sure some people love the with, hate the with, love the go to, hate the go to. Again, all the replays are up. There is this, there's the link in Barcadero TechNet. There also is a test streaming server, streaming.embarcadero.com for podcasts. We're going to be starting to podcast and create the podcast XML uh, so that you can subscribe to podcasts. And so we're, we're testing it on streaming.embarcadero.com. Uh, but you might, uh, you know, want to get access it by using YouTube. That's fine as well. Uh, just a uh, reminder again of the special offers through the end of June. And if you got XE4, you can just go to Red User, download, you get all that information. And if you're not sure, you can send us uh, emails. Uh, and one more reminder, I don't think I put it. Let's see. Oh, here. Let me just go back real quick. Sorry, but it's flashing so fast. you got to catch all that. Just a reminder of Code Rage again next Tuesday, Wednesday, 6 a.m. to about 2 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So here's the times up here, 6 a.m. PDT, 9 a.m. New York, 2 p.m. London, 3 p.m. Frankfurt, Paris, 5 p.m. Moscow, or do go to timeanddate.com uh, to get it in your, in your uh, local time zone, whatever it might be. But that's when we start in the morning and uh, lots of different sessions. You can go to thecoderage.com or embarcadero.slash coderage and get to it there. Okay, so for Q&A, let's see what we got here. There was... Uh, the other question, Lewis, where can you get the download like the TMS Cloud Pack registered user download, which is uh, you go over here to EDN. EDN Wednesday. Embarcado.com. This here under downloads, uh, registered user downloads. So that's the area to go and get your registered user downloads. And it means you need to be logged in, and and then you'll see all the files that you have the rights to access to. Right? Okay. Uh, what do you guys? Uh, Ilya is asking, what do we think about Connect and other uh, non-traditional user interface devices? Uh, we care about them a lot. Uh, um, I think it was what was it? Simon Stewart had a Connect, a T Connect for Delphi for Windows at, at one point in time. Uh, John Thomas, our Director of Product Management for Developer Tools, is working with Leap Motion, a company that makes a lot of those non-traditional user interface devices, things that gesture management and other kinds of things, recognition devices. So look for demos in the, in the future using some of those. I'm, uh, I'm working on component interface for the Parrot AR drone uh, quadcopter. So that you can use uh, Delphi or C++ Builder, Windows, Mac, or iOS, and eventually Android to control the the uh, the drone and fly it around the office or fly it around your neighborhood and take pictures and other things. Um, Swind Michael Swindell's got his whole house automated for home control, so we're working on demos for for you being able to program the interfaces to do home control of you know thermometers or or uh, you know, heat and air conditioning uh, devices, lights, cameras, garage doors, front doors, uh, locks, T 
TVs, stereos, the whole thing. But yeah, JT's looking at the Leap Motion, which HP has uh, licensed. Uh, Leap Motion did the original work with Microsoft on the Kinect device. And so lots of these kinds of things are coming out. I think it's the Samsung Galaxy 4. You could do gestures uh, to manipulate the user interface. So we're looking at all of that stuff, and it should just tie in to the gesture management that we already have. Um, and so work is going on there. Let's see. Steven said, need to use JSON like XML document and navigate nodes. Oh, sorry. That's a link that he just uploaded today. Blog post. Excellent, Steven. So I'll... I'll, I'll uh, Put that for everyone in the in the Q and A log. You'll see that link. Uh, there's a Code Central example that Stephen has put up for uh, navigating nodes using that come across as JSON. And uh, Ilya says, looking forward to Code Mobile next week. Absolutely, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, get up, get, have some coffee or water or whatever it might be, depending on the time. And we'll be uh, we'll be online. Here, Anders again will be uh, with us and then remote uh, in addition. So uh, I think, uh, let's see, is it possible to save picture from camera into remote database because the image of iPhone is very big in size? Uh, Sandro, you can take the bitmap and send it uh, back and store it in a bitmap blob. You could save it locally if you're using Interbase Lite. You could have a bitmap blob in your interbase database, and you could save it into a local interbase database, or you can pass it back as a type uh, via DataSnap, for example, or using some encoding, uh, and save it off uh, somewhere else. Absolutely. Or you could use a cloud infrastructure and save it there uh, using the TMS Cloud Pack, and then access it there. But absolutely. Regardless of the image size, I don't think there's any, I don't remember a limit. Usually uh, some of the iPhone apps, it'll ask you which size that you want, the original size or some other size. I think that's the Facebook upload or maybe it's the email, email, it's email yeah, sending well. app, yeah. Um, and then Stephen is doing a, uh, a session that relates to the, the property cross-platform demo. And uh, Stephen, that's the example that he uploaded. Uh, Property Cross, you can look at that on the internet. It's, uh, I think it's a site in UK that encourages people to build the same application using the same JSON feed for real real estate properties uh, in the UK and to implement that infrastructure and user interface on different mobile platforms and different platforms to give you a nice comparison of using the same architecture and then to see which ones do uh, a better job a lot of them are using scripting code and other things. Uh, of course, we're using native code, optimized native code for ARM processor on iOS. So fast, speedy, and all of the great style and work. So Stephen has uploaded that. It's in the Q&A log for all of you, the sample code. And he's going to be using that in his code rate session on the cross-platform property cross uh, demo API and how to build the iOS app for it. So any other last questions from everybody? Oh, uh, you know, I don't have the slide with our email addresses, so let me find that. I don't know where I put it. Let's see. Uh, I have to find another developer. Oh, this one might have it. Let's just go to the last slide down here. Okay, this one here. And bring it up. Print slide. So there's... Uh, our email address is Anders Olson or A. Olson at Embarcado.com. Uh, Al Manorino, Al.Manorino. Uh, David I at Embarcado.com. And again, the developer direct dot online at Embarcado.com. So if you have questions after this, um, wondering what's happening with Code Ridge Mobile or uh, what we're doing for summer slash winter school, Northern Southern Hemisphere, and other things during the summer months here in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, you'll see that appearing on the events page, but you can also send us emails or send developerdirect.online at marketo.com. And Anders, any last words just of encouragement, uh, cheerleading, or, or I don't know, it's Friday. At least, yeah. it's, at least it's not Friday the 13th. Oh, there you go. <laughs> no, um, come back for Code Ridge uh, Mobile next yeah, week. Next week. Any, Absolutely. Any other words last on, I guess, to, uh, San Francisco was cool. There was all the right people there. John Ivy was there, and yeah, Tim, it was Tim cool. Cook actually went on stage, yeah. right? Ran into a couple of people, like uh, 
Kate Stone and David Dean. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. Cool guys that work at Apple, guys and gals that used to work here with us and then are now uh, working at uh, at Apple. It's always good to have uh, friends that are at Google and Apple and Microsoft. Like I say, I was up at Microsoft uh, on Tuesday visiting with Steve Tashira and Herb Sutter, who's the chair of the ISO C++ uh, industry standards. So I spent some time with Herb, which was great, talking about C++, the language and the standard and, and such. Um, the Microsoft Build Conference is the last week in June here in San Francisco. Some people from here are going to go. They're going to be covering uh, Windows 8.1 and other things, Windows Mobile and phone. So we're staying on top of all of that. We're just working on Android next uh, instead of uh, you know iOS first, Android second, Windows Phone third. Those are the ones on our, our roadmap, WinRT ARM and WinRT native uh, Intel as well. Okay, everyone. And Tom and Sandro and Steven and Ilya and Lewis and everybody else who's on. Let's see who else. Troy and Victor. And Wes, all you guys, Tom, 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 and Tom. Uh, we've got a lot of people today that are online. Uh, it's been great having you all here at Developer Direct uh, Q2 2013, the season. And uh, stay tuned. We'll be doing more in the future. And we'll see you all at Code Rage next week. Make sure you register. Bye. Bye.